Well, I'm delighted to introduce two of our most exciting CEOs in the business in Canada. Steve Letwin was appointed President and CEO of I'm Gold in November 2010, and Peter Maroney founded Humana Gold in July of 2003 and serves as its executive chairman. Before joining I'm Gold, Steve worked in the oil and gas sector for many years, including as an executive vice president at Enbridge, president and COO of TransCanada Energy, and chief financial officer of TransCanada Pipelines, Newcore, NUAC, and Encore Energy. Peter founded Humana Gold in July 2003, and prior to that, he was the head of investment banking at a major Canadian investment bank, as well as practicing corporate law in Toronto with a focus on corporate and securities law and international transactions, so welcome to you both. I'd just like to start off, earlier this month on Barrick's first quarter conference call, CEO Mark Bristow described the industry, the gold mining industry, as in being in disarray. And I'm wondering whether you would uh, agree with that characterization. And secondly, why do gold miners endemically have lower return on equity than miners of other metals or other resources? Which one of you would like to start with that? Yeah, I'm not sure I would use disarray, but I, I, think, I think the point Mark was trying to make is, um, and it's probably good just to give a, a little comparison. So the 10 top gold companies in the world have a total capitalization of 120 billion US. Um, Microsoft is 960 billion alone. So our 10 top companies are just over 100 billion. In the mid-tier section where I live and work, there are 16 mid-tier companies. And uh, we total probably about 25% of the total market cap. And the market is shrinking. The capital pools, I think everybody here would, would agree, it's a lot more challenging to raise money. The five top cannabis companies in Canada now, over two years, have a total market cap of over 80 billion. So I think the point is this, um, and I think that's why Barrick and Rangold did the deal they did, which I, by the way, applaud. I think Mark Bristow and John Thornton did a very good deal there for the industry, as uh, Newmont and Gold Corp did. And I think, uh, I think we do need to consolidate. I've been saying this for two years, at least. Um, there are too many of us with too little capital. And uh, that may change, but right now we're competing for the same dollar. And unfortunately, those dollars are shrinking right now, although we hope that'll change. And so we literally have a lot of G&A, general and administrative expenses, spread across, in my opinion, too many companies with too few new investors. So. I would agree with that part of Mark's comments. Peter? Um, how to follow from that. Um, if I remember correctly, what he said was that the new barrack is, and again, I, I hope I'm not paraphrasing too much, is capable of rising above mm -hmm. the fray, capable of rising above this disarray. Mm -hmm. So um, that lends itself a bit to hyperbole a little bit of exaggeration. Uh, I'm not saying that Mark lends himself to hyperbole and exaggeration, but that, certain, that comment certainly does. I'm going to take a little bit of a different take. Uh, I will say that uh, the consolidation of Barrick and Rangold, which I think is a smart transaction, I equally think that Newmont and GoCorp is a smart transaction. I know that there are those who disagree. But if it's capable of rising above the fray, it suggests that it's not sure. And I would say that if you're going to engage in that type of a transaction and you're going to create something that is supposed to be different, then you should be sure. Because if you're capable only, that suggests to me that there is an uncertainty. It's still not clear. And I recently described it as a three-act play where we've seen the first act. We don't know what the second and third acts say. We haven't seen a synopsis of it. We don't know how the play ends. And yet we're already coming to the conclusion that there should be consolidation. We're coming to the conclusion that that's the only way forward. And I'm not sure that I agree with that. On the question of disarray, 
Uh, again, I hope you can appreciate that um, you mentioned that I was a lawyer, then an investment banker, and then I took this company public. Taking a company public and being an executive of a mining company is being a promoter. Uh, and those of you who are in the room who have run mining companies recognize that there's an element of uh, being a promoter in everything that we do. And so you have to be optimistic. I've gone from the dark side to the darker side to the very darkest side. Um, <laughs> But in being, a, in, in, in being a promoter, you have to be a little bit optimistic, and I think this is an industry where you have to be a little bit optimistic. Uh, I, don't I don't take what is happening today as the end of days. I think that it is a cycle. We're going through a cycle. It is at a point in the cycle that I was saying recently to someone, or just in, in the ante room, uh, to someone just before this uh, presentation, that it's the worst I've seen in probably 25 to 30 years. Uh, 15 years with this company, but been on boards of directors of public mining companies, represented those companies as a, either as an investment banker or as a lawyer. So it isn't particularly good, but let's not give up on it yet. Uh, the industry is not entirely in disarray. We are finding things. We're replacing ounces. We are consolidating, as those companies have done. Uh, we, are, we are producing. Uh, gold is range, seems to be range-bound. Uh, but it's range-bound within an area that, for many companies, perhaps the majority, certainly the plurality of companies, they're making money. We're generating free cash flow. We can, we can demonstrate that there's a value proposition. I think where there is a disconnect, perhaps what creates that disarray, is that we haven't done a very good job, in fact, we've done a very poor job, of communicating to the investing public what the thesis for investment in a gold mining company is. I think we've done a better job in communicating what the thesis is for investing in gold, but not necessarily in the gold equities. And I think that we have to get better at it. Uh, now, if I go back 25 years ago, those of you who are in the audience who have been around that long would remember that we used to model companies based on net asset value, and then it became cash flows. And now it's free cash flow and uh, the generation of EBITDA. And there seems to be an uncertainty of what it is that makes the difference in investing in a, in a mining company and in a gold mining company in particular. I personally think that it's a combination of many of those things. Yes, you should be generating free cash flow, but if you're overlooking the investment in the ground, if you're returning only money to shareholders and, and overlooking that investment in the ground, that creates a little bit of that, that disarray. So I have a bit of a different take on, on uh, that uh, comment of the market being, or at least the the, the uh, industry being in disarray. I don't believe the consolidation is the only path forward. I think the bigger is not better. I think the better is better. And I would say that, uh, and this is a plug perhaps to you, Steve, and certainly I think to ourselves, that the sweet spot to be is the intermediate mining companies. And if I'm right that we will enter a cycle where gold price improves and an investment in the equities will improve, the best place to be is in the intermediate sized companies. And consolidation for the sake of becoming bigger is a mistake. Replacing ounces becomes more difficult. We have to go to more uh, far-flung places, and that creates, that creates an imbalance between the risk and reward uh, 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 equation. I think it's fair to say, though, that many companies in this business are not being profitable at the current gold price. So what do you think is the true break-even price for gold miners? That is to say, at what price does gold have to be in order to make gold miners profitable or provide them with the same margins as an integrated producer like Glencore? So, so perhaps if I can begin, Steve. Sure. Uh, profit, and, and, I, and I know that there are many in other industries that, that disagree with this comment, but profit is, is different than cash flow and free cash flow and and I appreciate that we should be measured based on profitability, but boy, profitability is tough in, in, in an industry that doesn't attract a lot of attention, uh, where there are rules that are not designed to accommodate what the industry is about. An excellent example, and it's almost, an almost a real life example, uh, is uh, on a mine that we owned, that we sold uh, several years ago. Um, imagine the following. If you discover a million ounces and it costs you 50 million to develop that million ounces into production, then you discover a second million ounces and it costs you a million to develop that and put it into production, the businessman in me would say, well, then that's 2 million ounces over $51 million, and that's what you should be amortizing. 
Whereas accountancy rules, and I'm not an accountant, but accountancy, and I hope I'm not offending accountants in the room, but accountancy rules would say that you've got to amortize that first 50 million over the million ounces before you get to that second, 50, second million ounces over a million. And, and that seems skewered to me a little bit, and it leads to a different financial result, a different profit result. I agree that we should be generating cash flow. I agree with you that we should be generating free cash flow. Where it is not clear to me, and this is where, as an industry, perhaps as an industry participant, the World Gold Council, as a representative of this industry, should start to define it a little bit better. What is free cash flow? Uh, because if it is after investment, for example, in expansionary capital, then the industry will be doomed because we cannot expand, we cannot build new mines, we cannot find new ounces and then develop those new ounces if the holy grail is only free cash flow. On your question of profitability or generation of free cash flow, I think probably 1250 is a good sweet spot. I'd say that at 1250, perhaps as low as 1200, most of the companies, certainly the intermediate size and larger cap companies, begin to generate free cash flow. Below that, it, becomes, it starts to become a little bit more difficult. But so many factors go into it that it becomes very difficult to consider. Steve touched on a few moments ago that we can take steps to improve our GNA. I think the answer is yes, we probably can. Certainly, we're taking those steps now. The impact of currencies can have a very significant impact. The Brazilian real, the Brazilian reais four years ago was at 1.6. Today, it's at 4.09. And that makes a huge difference in terms of uh, the, the, the margin that we generate from operations in one country or another. Uh, and, and so it, it's difficult to gauge, but I'd say a good point would be 1250, perhaps as low as 1200, mm -hmm. where we start to generate free cash flow. But what is more interesting to me is the sensitivity. Uh, as an industry, we as a company in the industry are highly sensitive to metal prices. So uh, a $50 movement in gold price uh, takes what is a, perhaps a modest level of cash flow and free cash flow and makes it a multiple of that. So um, I, I, we've been range bound for a while in that range of probably 1,200 to 1,350 thereabouts. And between 1,200 and 1,350, this, this industry is generating good free cash flow. And in my view, that is not supported uh, by the share price. The share prices are are low by comparison to the cash flows that are being generated and the free cash flows being generated. Okay, Steve, same, same question. Yeah, I, I, I think Einstein said, you know, if you, uh, if you want to look at the definition of insanity, it's doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different outcome. There's a bit of insanity in the gold space where if we don't do something differently, we're going to continue to wither away. When I joined the industry from the oil and gas business in 2011, precious metals alone was uh, raised eight billion in equity. Do you know what that number is today? It's less than 100 million this year. The market is tired of the way we run our business. So we need to wake up and listen to the market and do something different. Mm -hmm. We're gonna have to go, in the absence of being able to raise equity, we have to go to a self-funding model. The oil and gas business had to do the same thing. So we can disagree about our valuations, but for the last seven years, gold price has averaged 1250. People are tired of it. People haven't seen the catalyst. We were supposed to go to $1,400 this year. Even Goldman Sachs said that, who had said gold was going to go to 900 just three years ago. So look, I'm as optimistic as the next guy. I wouldn't be in this business if I wasn't. I was in the oil and gas business 28 years. I saw six cycles. We need to pull up our socks and generate free cash flow to fund our businesses. Or we will disappear. And the mid-tier sector is a sector where we really need, as Peter said, to get our act together 
and start generating enough free cash flow to move the growth ahead because you know what? The market isn't there for us to raise the money. Go try and raise equity today. It isn't going to happen. What more is, gonna, what, what more is it going to take before investor sentiment improves, though, beyond a higher gold price? You need, you need a catalyst. I, I, I don't like saying it's got to be priced, but I think we do need the gold price to move out of that, as Peter said, that it's range-bound. We have a hard time sticking above $1,300. Have you watched it? It, it hits 1301, hits 1302. I get all excited. I, I know the rest of you do. You get up in the morning, gold's above 1300. And then the next three hours, somebody sells gold into the market and it's 1275. Today, it's hardly, it's having a hard time hitting 1270. Peter announces fantastic results. I, we announce a fantastic gold discovery. Our stock falls. It drops. Look, I'm not negative about it. I, I'm 63 years old. I've been around a long time and survived. And we'll survive this. I'm just saying we can't keep doing the same thing over and over again and expect that the market is just going to wake up one day and say, oh, we love you again. We need to change or we will suffer the consequences. So I'm not being fatalistic. We just need to make sure that we are in touch with the market. And a self-funding model right now is what the market is demanding. Given the difficult, oh, sorry, go ahead, Peter. Yeah, so I, um, where I agree uh, with what Steve has said is uh, that there has to be some change, uh, but where I am, perhaps if I can pick up on something that Steve said about the size of the industry. So the 10 largest companies have a market capitalization, I think Steve mentioned of 120 billion. I think the entire industry is somewhere in the range of 200 billion. At its height, it was probably 400 billion. Uh, and at some point over the course of the last decade, that's about the amount of cash that was on Apple's balance sheet. So it's not a very big industry. But again, allow me to be a bit optimistic. Um, and I, I think this is important. Gold equities are now trading at all-time lows to gold price, even with a range-bound gold price. And um, we have a small industry. And we have a very big market, a very, very big market that has become much bigger than it was. As I was saying to someone in the ante room outside, I think that the market has overlooked what is always true, which is you have to look at risk reward, you have to look at volatility. Uh, and it is also true that markets overshoot and undershoot. And I think we're in a classic situation today where the broader market is overshooting and is disregarding volatility, it is disregarding risk, geopolitical risk, socioeconomic risk. It's trite for me to say what you already know. World debt is more than double what it was in 2008. And I know I'm not up on current events, but we had a financial crisis in 2008. So world debt is high, very high. Uh, we have geopolitical conflict in at least three really hot, hot spots in the world. And yes, gold is, seems to be range bound. And if I can step back for a moment, if Goldman Sachs said it was going to 900 and it didn't, why did we believe that it would go to 1400? Yeah. So let's be countercyclical a little bit. And part of countercyclical is that the catalyst, in my view, is not gold price doing something or the gold companies changing something. The catalyst is the broader market. A recognition that the broader market is at risk. And if that broader market is at risk, money will have to find a home. And when money tries to find a home in this very small sector, as you were describing, it will be the corporate equivalent of the volume of water of a Niagara Falls through a garden hose. It will be unparalleled. We will see new heights. I hope I'm not being overly optimistic. And I know it's very difficult today. Um, our share price was down significantly yesterday, and we're 
Danielle and I, our chief executive officer, and I were scratching our heads and wondering what exactly changed from the morning to the night, because we can't really see anything that would account for that type of a drop during the day. So it hurts. Uh, it hurts me personally. I'm invested, and I bought, buy, continue to buy shares. It hurts you as investors. It hurts executives of companies. It hurts all of us. But I think we need to, to, to keep an eye on the reality that the broader market is attracting and sucking so much uh, money into it that there isn't anything really left in this industry. But when that changes, and it will change because everything goes through a cycle, it will be that equivalent of, of the volume of a Niagara Falls amount of water coming through a garden hose because this industry is so small. And, and we will see new heights. We'll be having this conference a year from now or maybe two years from, from now. And we'll, we'll be sick, uh, we will be looking back and wondering why we were worried in the first place. What mistakes do you think mining companies keep making? And the same question, what mistakes do investors keep making when investing in gold companies? Well, I think, I, you know, I wrote a paper uh, three years ago, uh, and I was looking at our reserve situation in the gold space, and I'd done similar work in oil and gas, and I'd happened to be right in the oil and gas sector in the 90s, and I made a lot of money but I was wrong this time in the gold sector because I thought we were probably going to hit peak gold this year, last year. But in 2018, we actually produced more gold than we ever have in our history. We produced 109 million ounces. And we seem to be able to, because of the emphasis on near, mi near mine exploration, which is smart, short cycle economics, I underestimated how much of that we could do in my formula. So I made a mistake. And because of the focus on free cash flow, as Peter was talking about, we're seeing actually more gold being produced than we ever have. So although the reserves are falling, as Peter talked about, the long term, and there will come a point, as he said, where this will cross. The question is when? When do we wake up in the morning and somebody says gold production is actually falling relative to last year and we have a situation because of the small industry where this Niagara Falls situation occurs and the price of gold goes up to what Rob McEwen loves to talk about $5,000 an ounce or $10,000 an ounce. That truly would be a party. Um, but right now, um, we haven't seen that math, so we continue, and then the market is saying, we're not gonna give you any money to invest. Stop, stop doing that, because guess what? We're not gonna give you any more money to do that. Your history around building mines with rates of return that are acceptable um, hasn't been there. So we may challenge the market and say the market has got it wrong, but the market is what pays our bills. So we need to listen to the market. And the market is saying too much gold. Not enough reserves, we all know that we're, reserves are falling, but our actual production continues to rise. So we do need to react to that in some form or fashion. I don't know if we could form an OPEC for gold producers. I've thought about that. Because, you know, we're throwing too much gold into the market right now, relative to what the market wants. Yeah. Um I am not smart enough to really understand peak gold. Um, one of our executive officers has a, an, an excellent thesis. He was an analyst in the financial community, and he has an excellent thesis on peak gold. My gut tells me, however, that uh, the supply side is never as good on driving value and price as the demand side. And so we could get to a point where we actually throttle back on production, 
But I'm not sure that that's going to be determinative over the longer term of what happens to price. What happens to price for gold is going to be dependent on the demand side. And, and um, I think that that is where we should be placing our focus. Now on the demand side, what's interesting to me is where is a lot of the buying occurring? A lot of the buying is occurring in Asia with certain central banks. And I know it's, it's a bit difficult because I don't know if I can talk in 20 year terms or 10 year terms or even five year terms. And certainly markets are more focused on something that is more immediate than that. But if we looked at a longer term tra tra trajectory, we're seeing something that is very unique, which is the de-dollarization of some parts of the world. And, and there is a re-emphasis among certain countries, certain um, companies, industries, uh, central banks uh, on investment in gold. And, and so I, I would encourage all of us to be focusing on the demand side rather than the supply side to determine ultimately what happens uh, to, to, to gold price. But really, uh, we're manufacturers of gold, but we're not really that interested in gold price as much as we're interested in, in the price of our shares. And on the price of our shares, what is interesting to me is that as an industry, and as a company in that industry, this is one of the lowest points of, of, of price of, of, of shares to metal price that I've seen in at least the last couple of decades. And I think that represents a real value proposition. And, and, and that is in part what I think the market um, perhaps is misunderstanding to go to your question, that there's a real value proposition in owning stock, not just owning gold, even at gold prices that are in that range of about 1200 to maybe 1350 that range that it has been in for the past several years. Okay, great. Thank you so much. I think we've reached the time. Anthony? Thank you. Thank you so much.